Welcome to episode 52 of the Energy Balance Podcast, where we teach you how to live without constant hunger and cravings, fatigue, brain fog, poor sleep, and other low energy symptoms by maximizing your cellular energy. I'm Jay Feldman. I'm a health coach and independent health researcher. And joining me again today is my good friend, Mike Fave. Mike and I have been studying health and nutrition together for a long time now, and Mike also draws on his experiences from working within the healthcare industry. Today's episode will be part four of our series discussing men's hormonal health, where we've been discussing how you can improve male reproductive health from the bioenergetic perspective. If you haven't listened through parts one through three of the series, I'd highly recommend you go back and do that. In part one, we discussed the problem with calorie deficiencies, carbohydrate deficiencies, and protein excess. In part two, we discussed how you can increase testosterone with saturated fats and how you can decrease estrogen. And then in part three, we discussed how you can optimize exercise and sleep to build muscle. In today's episode, part four, we'll be discussing workout supplements to avoid and how you can decrease stress and the importance of decreasing stress for hormonal health. In particular, we'll be talking about how stress can decrease muscle mass, increase body fat, and disrupt our hormones, and then we'll discuss how you can decrease and manage stress to improve hormonal health. And then on the supplement side, we'll be talking about whether popular fitness supplements like nitric oxide boosters, pre-workouts, and intra-workout carbohydrates are supportive on the bioenergetic level. We'll be talking about why supplements are not the answer for improving body composition and hormonal health and when it does make sense to use supplements. And then we'll also talk about why most weight loss supplements are not a good idea and what can be done instead to lose fat and whether it makes sense to use exogenous hormones to improve our hormonal state. If you're new to this podcast, I'd highly recommend you go back and listen to episodes one through seven, where we took some time to build a foundation as far as the bioenergetic perspective is concerned. To check out the show notes for today's episode, you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash podcast, where I'll link to the studies and articles and anything else that we reference throughout today's episode. And if you are struggling with any of the hormonal symptoms that we've discussed, whether that's trouble putting on muscle or trouble losing stubborn body fat or low libido or other hormone related symptoms and you've been listening through this series and maybe you're not sure where to start or how to apply some of the information or maybe you have started applying some of the information but you aren't really sure where to go next then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com call where you can sign up for a free call with me where i'd be happy to offer some suggestions as far as how you can improve your hormonal health And again, if you are dealing with any of these symptoms or any other low energy symptoms, whether that's fatigue or chronic cravings and hunger or joint pain or digestive inflammation or brain fog or poor sleep, or if you're dealing with any other low energy symptoms or chronic health conditions, then you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy, where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course, where I'll explain how these different symptoms and conditions come down to a lack of energy and what you can do from the diet and lifestyle perspective to rectify this and increase your cellular energy. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy. And with that, let's get started. So throughout these last few episodes, we've alluded to how much of an impact stress has on our hormones. And we've talked about it in terms of physiological stress a little bit throughout and then also definitely in the past, uh, which I'll take a a minute to define. And then we'll also talk about like emotional stress and psychological stress, but big picture, these things have a major impact on our hormonal health. One of the best ways to cause the wasting of muscle, increasing in increases in body fat, you know, disrupting hormones, taking libido. Um, the, one of the best ways to do all those things is to increase stress. So it's, it's an important thing to talk about at least to give, just a baseline of, of its importance and some of the basics of what we can do about it. Of course, it's also a pretty in-depth topic that we can't address all of right now, but just big picture. So we've talked a little bit about physiological stress and just to clarify, basically physiological stress is the response that happens when we have a lack of energy. So that's why it's so important to make sure we're getting enough carbs and fats and of course protein as well, although that's a little, a little bit less from the energetic side. But this is also why it's important not to overtrain, why recovery is so important, 
is because if we have that imbalance between the energy we have available and our energy demands, we're going to be under physiological stress. And that's what's going to drive increases in stress hormones like glucagon, adrenaline, and cortisol, which are the direct hormones that oppose the sex and reproductive hormones like testosterone and the other androgens for for men and then you know progesterone and the related hormones for women and also thyroid hormones just those uh, and some of the other steroid hormones that are the more major re- metabolic regulators so th- one of the i guess the way i would put emotional stress or psychological stress is that that falls in the energy demand category where those things are basically a huge drainer of energy and you can have some amount of emotional and psychological stress without actually causing physiological stress. But in general, those are really good ways to cause physiological stress because they really drain the available energy, especially for our brains. And then if you don't have carbs available, you don't have adequate blood sugar, then it is going to trigger the release of those stress hormones. So with that in mind, we do want to do things that are going to reduce emotional and psychological stress, considering they're one of those main stressors, main energy drainers and energy demands. and there's several different strategies there that can be helpful. I mean, there's a ton of strategies, but we could just go through a few of those and uh, talk about, yeah, some of like kind of the big bang for your buck or just a few things to maybe consider when it comes to ways to reduce stress. Yeah. And I just, I want to put into context the, all, all these stressors activate the same system, right? So gut irritation, endotoxin, lack of sleep, they all impact the, the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis in, in kind of the same way. The mm-hmm. stress response is generalized. And this is right. this is like Tan Selye's work is that the stre- the overall stress response is generalized. And so basically any so just feeling like you don't have enough time to do something, uh some your boss at work gets up in your face and just, you know, makes you feel like crap or or you're you feel like you're running late or um, a fight with a significant other or friend. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Or, or you just like have too much going on. You feel overwhelmed. All of those things, they hit that stress system much like, you know, and much like if you had like severe gut irritation or something like that, they all, they all hit that access access in the, kind of the similar way, but through di- like via different means. But all by draining energy, which is what leads to that, that stress exactly. system activating. Yeah. yeah. And and your emotional and your felt sense is sort of like, that's a guiding system to let you know, like, wow, like if you're feeling overwhelmed, it's like your body's like, you're, you're starting to feel that, that drain on resources. Right. So, mm-hmm. and, and it's important, I think, to make that distinction so, so that you can understand that like what your body is telling you is, is right. You got to pay attention to the signals. You know, when you feel, when you're at work and you're, if your boss is going to like get all up in your face about whatever it is that, and your stress your stress system is going off it's because you're you, it's like an attack right on some emotional ego personal whatever level whatever level however you want to define it i don't i don't know the specific however everyone has a different word for it so and with that when that happens it it will cause the release of adrenaline and cortisol cuz the the stress system is an is a energy activating system in the sense that if you don't have enough energy it's like mobile mobilizing resources it'll Backup mobilize energy. these yeah. exactly yeah. It's like a backup system. So it starts to mobilize resources from out of your tissues, out of your stores for to meet whatever the Im- imposed stress is. So, and then also like there's some, with the inflammation stuff, there's there's some uh, like immunosuppressive effects, right? To limit, to initially limit some of the damage. Uh, or long-term, it has a lot of drastically negative implications. So all of these things are kind of hitting the same system. So it's actually extremely important that the your mindset and your psychological and emotional and, and whatever like allostatic load or amount of stress that's applied is is managed as well as as much as your diet and your sleep and everything else is diet is dialed in those things have to be managed just as much or else you're you're kind of like you know you're you're up the creek without a paddle type of deal um so and and I, I think the reason I I stress this cuz I think a lot of people look past this and maybe I'm just, I'm projecting on other people because this is something that I have done where it's like, well, I eat well and you know, I get my sleep and I get to the gym and I get sun whenever I can. But at the, like in the meantime, my job and things that I was doing were still like seriously stressing me out to the extent that after that day, like I had to take 
a day to just lay in bed because I was so exhausted from what I was doing or it was just like the work was too long. And so whatever it was, right? So it getting out of those situations or learning how to manage with them or trying to fit. And the other thing is, is it doesn't have to be just getting out of the situation, right? Because sometimes you don't have the opportunity to, if it's your work life or whatever that is, it's figuring out how to do something about it. And the example that I always like to put and something that Ray has talked about, um, and I actually got this example from him. And it's a study he talked about where it, he talks about learned helplessness, where when you have a rat, they tie it down to the table and the rat's fighting to get out. When it's fighting to get out, it actually develops ulcers in its intestines. And that's indicative of the stress response. That is one of the main uh, things that you see in the generalized stress response. And this is Hans Selye's work. This is what Hans Selye saw in the animals he worked with is they developed intestinal ulcers from stress. So, but when they allowed the rat to bite down on a stick to do something about the situation, it was powerful and it, and it, it had a protective effect. So sometimes you can have your life on point as far as your diet and your, uh, your sleep and you know, your supplementation and whatever else. But if the stress isn't, isn't addressed as well, and you're not like part of those things can be actively doing something about the stress, but learning how to manage the stress or reframe the stress, if you can't get out of it can be really helpful, or even just concocting a plan to get out of the stress. And that's something that I've actually done with people that I've worked with, even recently, they're in a situation where they, they can't, like, they can't bear the situation. It's just the psychological like they don't like where they're living. They don't like the people that they're around. They're, they're in a, under a lot of stress with just by those areas. And so one of the things that we talked about and like the manifestation of that for this person is, you know, like a lot of mood stuff and, or it could be gut, gut issues, whatever it is. Um, this for them is specifically like gut distress. Like they're having a lot of like uh, IBS type symptoms. For them, something that was very helpful and, and was giving them hope was creating a plan to get out. I'm going to do X, Y, and Z so I can get to where I want to go. For that person, it was akin to biting on the stick. And I've seen this with, with other people as well. Just creating a, creating a plan to do something creates this almost like the, the mind and the body sort of synergize for it. And they get to a point where it's like, wow, there's actually a way out. And then it starts to mobilize energy. And it, it actually helps relieve the stress in those circumstances, as long as that plan isn't too overwhelming, right? Um, so I think that that's something that's really important to keep in mind is that this is just as powerful as these other lifestyle modalities. And, it, and a lot of people say, oh, stress, stress this, stress that. It, it's something that really needs to be maintained. It, even if it's even if it's just reframing your situation when you're when like, if you're really in a bad situation at work, just reframing it, giving yourself small goals throughout the day that you can like give like you can congratulate yourself on if you've completed them, um, giving yourself checkpoints and then also making time for yourself in the day to just like have that break, which is something I think we're going to talk about in a second. But just being able to sit down and just unwind. Those are um, really, really important things to, to keep in mind and to help with not being overwhelmed. And then also having, creating a structure around the day so that you, you're able to like manage because things can start to snowball into themselves. If you don't, you don't have a proper structure for your day. And I know structure isn't necessarily for a Pete, but sometimes it's really helpful. Yeah. And that can be individual. Some people really like having structure. Some people really like having some freedom and I think as you were saying, the structure kind of helps, but it's more along the planning, like feeling like you are getting things done or you are working towards a certain goal. Uh, yeah. But that can look different for different people. It doesn't have to, you know, structure can mean different things. But yeah. so so I think it's a good thing to point out that a lot of people are in that kind of learned helplessness state uh, state where they're stuck. They feel like there's nothing they can do. And a lot of people, I think, also don't recognize that they might not that they might be feeling that way. And I think part of this is because a lot of people go through their lives day to day and aren't really don't have time to reflect or aren't thinking about things in those terms. And it's just kind of always going from one thing to the next. Our minds are always elsewhere. They're always distracted by technology or whatever we have to do next. And we never actually take a moment to examine how we're feeling, or maybe we get angry. There's an outburst and we don't like, we don't even know what we're angry about. Like what led to that in the first place? What are you actually feeling? And so that I, I think that's a nice kind of lead into taking some structured time to examine how you feel your thoughts 
uh, your just what you're experiencing and and where you know are you even stressed? A lot of people are very stressed and don't <laughs> don't really realize it, or they're just going from one thing to the next. And of course, there are people who are also naturally laid back and don't experience stress in that same way. So it all depends. But some really great tools for evaluating where you're at and working back to living in the present and examining your thoughts and examining your feelings. Uh, so, so some of those really great tools would be meditation and mindfulness, as well as journaling. And there's a ton of different techniques here that can be used. And some might some you know some people might like some of these techniques better than others. So I don't really want to push any particular one rather than just taking the time to explore these things. There's a ton of apps out there for meditation that will make it way yep. easier. There's a you know a million different techniques you can find online and some of which I've found helpful, some I haven't, same with various clients, and it's different for each person. I think the easiest thing, though, to start is to just start writing stuff down. Even sure. if yeah. I think that's like the easiest, simplest, without taking any research, just start writing down, you know, what what are you thinking? What are you feeling? And then I, the other thing I think is helpful is after you do that is, you know, take then to do something about it. Like I, something that was helpful for me in a bad spot was like a gratitude type of journal, like just three mm -hmm. things that you're grateful for. So it's like, this is all the stuff I'm thinking, this is what's bothering me, whatever. And then these are the three things I'm grateful for. And that's almost like doing something about it, right? It, it, what, just writing the stuff down is doing something about it and like getting things out. I think that's important. And I feel like that's something that's very important to me and why I'm grateful for like our friendship. Like we could talk about things, but then also with like family and stuff, like I have a good relationship with my dad. So I like if I have a stressful situation and I think Danny and Georgie touched on this as well, like having some element of people around a good friend or a family member that you can just vent to. And it doesn't mean that the person has to solve your problem, but just venting it out and letting somebody else know what's going on and getting it out of your system. It's almost like it relieves. It. It's like, ah, oh, I was mad about this. And then like, da, 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 like machine gun it out. And then afterwards, it's like, oh, I feel a lot better. You know, I'm not that mad anymore. <laughs> So you don't have to hold on to it and things don't have to build up and, and pile up. Yeah, absolutely. And I think even a step before like writing things out or um, a step before like writing things out in a journal, which I think that's perfect, but even just uh, even a bigger, more broad, important point here. And this even, even, uh, I mean, like talking with somebody can work here too, but just having time or space to not like to be non distracted to just sit and that you know sit with your thoughts spend time outside not doing anything spend time without your phone without tv on maybe maybe without music or like with quiet music at, at most yeah. just because so 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 much of the time i've found that i think we're getting more and more distracted as a society and we can talk about why that might be and and all of that but the important point is there's so few times when we're just left with our thoughts and so if you want to carve out that time for journaling or for meditation or mindfulness or talking with a friend, that's great. If you don't want to do those things and just want to have time to do absolutely nothing, that works too. A lot of times just having that time to kind of process things in whatever way works best for important. you. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, makes a huge difference. And I think it's something that so many of us are deficient in, uh, whether it's because we're just thinking about the next thing we have to do or we're thinking about something that happened in the past or whatever it is. Yeah. And I mean, that's the reason for me, what's helpful is creating the structure. I know it's for some people it might, but like actually structuring that time in mm -hmm. where you know that it's like this hour and this at on, on the day, I'm just going to lay out in the sun. Like, and that's something that I do is like, I'm going to go lay out on the grass in the sun. Or when I was living up North in the cold in the winter and it was dark and I had to work night shift, I just set up like a, a whole light like it's like a light bed essentially. And it was this all halogen lamps and some red lights. And I would just like take an hour and I would just lay under it. Would I fall asleep sometimes? Yeah. I would just like, I would like pass out other times. I would just sit there and I would just think, and I would just, sometimes I'd play music, but I think it's important to, and out for me, that was a period of time to sort of take all of these thoughts that I had or whatever was going on and I would just like conceptualize them all together and, and I would articulate them to myself and, or I would, you know, I would go talk to my dad about it after, or we would talk about it. I think another time that's really good for people, um, is like a hot shower. Like just for some people, just like taking like a long hot shower and just like having, feeling the heat and whatnot. And then, you know, just, you have that time where just, you just start like have processing thoughts and whatnot and it feels good, whatever. 
for some people, I mean, I'm not a bath person, but you know, for some people they could, they could have a bath or something, or it could be a walk in nature, whatever it is, everybody can find. But I think making the time for that is extremely important. And it's not like, yes, you know, it's like you're out in nature or whatever, it's this and that, but it's like just having that time by yourself also to, to collect yourself. And then, so I think we have two aspects here, being able to collect yourself and then also the, having like community and stuff is, is I think really important for people. Um, and I think that's something that's also really broken down. So I guess to recap those things is if you're in a situation where you can't, where you feel like you can't do anything about it, start planning to do something about it. And that doesn't mean that you need to do something right away, but just the element of planning, like sitting down and being like, this is where I am and this is what's going on and how can I get there? Even if it doesn't, like it doesn't have to make sense right off the bat, just like you're thinking about it, right? And just thinking about it is the first step, having the time to do that and then also having community. I think those are three really important things that can help people and they're, you can do them right now, right? You can go take a hot shower right now you could start writing just on, for me, it's just like on printer paper or whatever, whatever garbage paper I have around, I'll just start writing on it or I have a note in my phone, whatever it is, those, however you do it, those are easy things that can be done right now to help deal with whatever's going on. And, and I think we see that even with like famous philosophers or people, men who were thinking, they just were thinking out loud on paper. Right. And then over time they like refined it. Yeah. Yeah. And just to clarify also an hour is great. You were mentioning like an hour for your time of like non-distracted yeah. time or just time to process things. A lot of people, that's a lot of time to carve out, especially at first. So even five to 10 minutes is a perfect start. Uh, yeah. That's still something. And the, and that doesn't have, again, like it doesn't have to be intentional time. It's almost like creating time to lack intention where it's just free for your mind to kind of flow. Uh, and you, again, you can add structure in there. You can make it a, a just free journaling you can make it more structured journaling you can make it a structured yeah. meditation there's a, there's a ton of options here but at least something uh, which yeah. could be nothing like that can be time to do nothing that works that's that counts so yeah, uh, yeah. and and i would say also the a, a lot of people experience like racing thoughts when they go to lay down at night uh, before they go to sleep and sometimes that can be related to low blood sugar not getting enough food too much stimulation like like stress wise there's there can be various physiological uh, aspects there. But additionally, sometimes that's because we just go from one thing to the next all day and we're constantly distracted. We're constantly not in the present. And then when we finally go and lay down with no distractions, our body or our mind is trying to process everything that happened throughout the day and, and yeah. trying to like put things together and, and connect things. And then it brings you to other thoughts. And so a lot of times those racing thoughts can be brought out because we don't have any time during the day where our mind is allowed to kind of roam free. And as you mentioned, a lot of like the, the great thinkers had a lot of free time to think. And there's so much value in that. Uh, even if you're worried about wanting to be more productive or whatever it is, having space and time, um, like giving yourself space and giving yourself time is, is huge. Yeah. And so I think, I, I think the, the idea of processing things is really important, right? If you go through a stressful event or something, being able to look back and process is important if you, because if you're just going, 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 you just, you start piling up all these little things. And I think having that time to process, having that time to hash things out for yourself, if it's with a friend, if it's in a journal, whatever it is, I think that's really powerful. Uh, and I think this is something that community was for in, in the past. Like you had mm -hmm. that the family or friends around you that you could, you know, you could talk about things, get different perspectives, articulate the ideas, understand why this, why that, and learn from it. Yeah. And, and just some other points here, just to kind of, at least on my end, I think, wrap up some of the stress side of things. Nature and sunlight are really great vehicles for all of this, uh, which we've kind of alluded to. Uh, socializing is a huge component here. And that doesn't have to be strict socializing. That can mean that when you're at the gym, you're talking with people, you're maybe making some friends there or doing any, uh, you know, we talked about all these other forms of exercise that may have, that may have more social aspects to them, whether that's martial arts or a team sport where that kind of the social aspect is built in. But yeah, and, and even more now when everything is becoming remote and virtual, people are obviously experiencing, at least a lot of people are experiencing that, like the impact of a lack of social interaction. And I think that is going that's a major cost to to all of these things and 
something that we that that's worth putting the effort into as much as possible um to prioritize and to you know again some people might not be able to socialize quite as much right now but for those who can yeah i think it, and i think that's something that i think that it's something that people in this time also need to really take stock of the importance is is the importance of community and socialization mm -hmm. and you know having having those people that you can trust around you especially now i think it's really important right. yeah. right? i think yeah. just with everything that's going on and currently it's just you need to have that community those people that you can reach out to those people that you have around you you know if you're having a hard time and whatnot so yeah so let's talk about some of the popular supplements that are used for building muscle losing fat getting better workouts and pumps and uh you know for hormonal health there's a lot of them which i think is already part of the problem and one of the first things i want to talk about but yeah so let's talk about a lot of these popular supplements and let's start with the ones that are maybe not so great you know when considering things from the bioenergetic view and then there are some that are popular that are still beneficial and then several that are not popular that would be more beneficial so to start I, I think just the concept and we've obviously hammered this home at this point how much nutrition and movement and sleep and stress have impacts on body composition and hormonal health so the idea that we need to be taking these stacks of different supplements you know we need to be taking handfuls of of pills to optimize our our muscle building you know our, our muscle gains or anything else is just kind of uh i don't know off base and yes there's value in taking certain supplements but they should all have a particular purpose if you are using them and just this idea that uh, we should be taking some mass gainer or some stack of supplements with a multivitamin and fish oil and all these other uh you know pills in there even if some of them are beneficial um just this idea i think is is just very much missing the mark and also there's potential drawbacks to a lot of these supplements that we'll dig into so considering that too i don't think it would be a great idea yeah uh do you want to do you want me to go into some of the specific ones yeah 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 i mean you have i think that some of the worst ones to to start off with especially are within the bodybuilding spheres like some of the pre-workout supplements and uh, particularly some of the nitric oxide boosters. And then just in general with these supplements, even besides those, like a lot of the supplements have completely crap ingredients. Yeah. So it's like, even if they have vitamins, it's forms that aren't the best forms to use. Even if they have, um, even if the forms are right, then there's like magnesium stearate, there's silica or silicon dioxide, titanium dioxide, coloring, and since everybody's low sugar in that sphere, it's like erythritol is the main sweetener or <laughs> I don't know, like, like, I mean, stevia is not terrible, but it's like artificial sweeteners. If it is, if it's like aciflume potassium or the aspartame or uh, sucralose, all these like BS sweeteners. And it's just, it's just not like, it's, it's not a, those things are, are not helpful right and they're not 100 necessary for the product and then even with that some as we, as i alluded to earlier some of the compounds in there like the nitric oxide boosters where you have all the beet nitrate stuff and taking like higher amounts of arginine just let your veins pop out is not necessarily ideal um you don't want to be i mean there's a place for nitric oxide in the body but just artificially raising it so that you have like high amounts of vasodilation is not necessarily what you want um, so like, I think it's really important to, to keep those things in mind. And then, I, I mean, I'm not even going to get into all the new plant-based protein powders and things like that, which I think would be a huge issue for a lot of people digestive wise. Um, and then obviously dairies, depending on tolerance, but a lot of these, a lot of the protein powders as well, like it's depending on how they're processed can be like, it can be a serious issue for digestion. They have to be processed well. And a lot of people notice this with protein powders where they make them feel terrible. And you take, you take like a whey or a casein, you start treating it at high temperatures, isolating it and do all these, you know, with different chemicals, whatnot. I don't know the whole process it can really mess up your digestion. So it's like, just cause it has a protein amount on the, on the container, doesn't mean that it's necessarily usable or that it's necessarily the best, the best form or it's been, prepared the best way right like you wouldn't you wouldn't take a steak burn it to death right you completely blacken the steak and then 
<laughs> and then it's oh it has 30 grams of protein so it must be good right there's a there's a quality a quality element that needs to be kept in mind there so it's not that whey is bad or that casein is bad i mean whey after exercise like there's a use for it um you don't want to be shoveling whey protein shakes all day long as your uh as your main source of protein right there's obviously issues with that but there's a there's a point to having whey and like a starchy meal after workout as far as spiking insulin and whatnot like there's physiologic basis there but you want to be making sure that it's a high high quality way right you want to be making sure that the ingredients it does not loaded with a bunch of bs ingredients and um and that is processed appropriately yeah yeah and just taking a step back looking at these supplements as a whole i mean so much of it is just built around marketing like you were talking about all the blue dot you know the coloring dyes that are in there and just i mean it's cotton candy flavor or whatever <laughs> and when you see like the labels and everything like the marketing is so obvious and people recognize it no one's like no one's denying that but the reason for that is because it's so much easier to say the reason like a the reason why you're not where you want to be is because you didn't take this pill it's the and then b it's like this is such an easy thing to do and everybody wants the easy kind of fix or easy way to get there and it's much less sexy than saying you know you really need to get at least eight hours of sleep per night like that's yeah. like you can't buy that in a pill and it takes some effort and it's not you know it's not as fun or as fun as like reducing your alcohol intake like people yeah. you know it's like i'd rather party and take my my muscle gainer and it's like well it doesn't really work like that no it doesn't it really doesn't it's it, it's it's much easier for people it's much easier to sell people on the idea of this pill or this one thing that you're missing rather than like even the guys who are taking steroids even the guys who are on performance enhancing drugs the ones who are really looking the way that they're looking they're dieting their diets are pristine right like they're for the most part, I mean, they may not be 100% following what we're talking about here, but the diet is still compared to like the standard diets in general is pristine. You know, it's 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 vegetables, lean proteins, and then very easily digested starches. Like the 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 meme bodybuilding diet is chicken, broccoli, and rice, right? Or mm -hmm. steak, broccoli, and rice, or white fish, broccoli, and rice. Like the the diet is very clean. It's supposed to be on the uh, like easily digested. And they're eating on a consistent schedule and they're sleeping and they're working, they're working out on a very specific regimen with, with planned resting and with monitoring volume and, and then also using drugs, like the whole system, like they're doing a systemic approach. And then those supplements that a lot of them take are on the side. It's like, yeah, it helps out. You know, you, you're feeling a little bit tired because you're dieting down, you take a supplement full of stimulants and caffeine and whatnot it helps you for your workout sure also is is it 100 percent healthy depending on what they're doing no it's not a lot of times it's not like starving yourself taking performance enhancing drugs and then using like heavy stimulants and heavy lipolytic agents like clenbuterol and whatnot is definitely not a good idea for long-term health will you look mm -hmm. great yeah you probably will if you're going to be doing all that but it, the the point here is even those guys are taking a systemic approach to things and so it's easy to get sold on a supplement, but we'll, the most important part to keep in mind is it's all a systemic approach, right? And especially if you're not on the performance enhancing drugs, you're, you're, you're not going to be able to do some of the things that some of these guys are doing. And it's not, the, it's not necessarily the R, the nitric oxide booster that's making them look the way that they're looking. It's, it's a whole lifestyle. That's a job. It's a full-time job. And it's yeah. systemic. It's not just a, it's not one thing. It's not just the drugs, right? You could take drugs, but you don't train, you don't eat, you don't sleep, whatever. It's not going to be the same. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and again, the, the like anabolic steroids and everything make a huge difference there. So I know just talking about like the clean bodybuilding diet, I have seen people who do that and various other things and have a ton of health issues, but still look incredible. You know, they're like male model type people uh, yeah so yeah there's definitely a cost to those things and and uh you can get away with a lot without you can get get away with a lot using those sorts the of drugs, drugs. and yeah. yeah and then also with those diets they work well for looking a certain way not necessarily health but again that still as you're saying requires a lot of commitment compared to the person who just wants to take the pill to look better well and it also is addressing systemic 
things, right? Like yes. yeah. the you can get away with a lot on those drugs, yes, but and and you cannot sleep and you can eat crap and you still like decent, right? But the guys who are really, you know, that you're really blowing it out, that are really like top of the top and they're getting the results and they're on magazine covers and this and that, mm-hmm. that's the lifestyle. That's lifestyle plus drugs a lot of times. I don't I mean I can't speak for everyone in the industry. I have no idea what everyone's doing. But I would say on average, my guess would be that it's a combination of real hard work in managing their lifestyle on top of using performance enhancing drugs. Right. And it's like it has to be the combination if you want to get to that level. Right. And eat. Yep. so if you're not going to use drugs, which is basically we don't necessarily recommend using drugs, we well, we don't recommend using these drugs, um, then it has to be lifestyle. And then in all cases, these random supplements are on the side. And then even, and then with that said, you want to be using the right supplements, right? You don't mm-hmm. like just getting your veins to pop out from an NO booster is like, okay, your veins pop out, but it's not necessarily like, what is the larger context? What is the larger context of taking large amounts of arginine? Is there a risk to it? Does that risk outweigh the benefits of looking this way or that way? Uh, I think on our side, we would say with high amounts of arginine, yeah. So that's something to, to keep in mind. Yeah. Yeah. So I want to dig into some of the details there as far as these different supplements go. Also, just to clarify, I meant uh, male fitness model, not like male model when I was saying it earlier. But yeah, yeah, so let's dig into some some of the specifics. So there are a lot of supplements that are meant to to boost nitric oxide. There's a lot of kind of faux reasons for this that A, A, it does stimulate uh, vasodilation. So it'll make your veins pop out, which is what a lot of people are looking for when they're uh, when they're taking these things and there's like some suggestion that this can increase performance because you're increasing like blood flow and things like that, which potentially it can, but we've talked about nitric oxide in the past as basically a stress factor that does induce vasodilation, but it, it's basically meant to do so when there's not enough vasodilation, which would happen if you're not producing enough, uh, enough carbon dioxide, which is supposed to be the primary vasodilator. So we don't want to be doing things that are driving that stress aspect of vasodilation. And nitric oxide also happens to, beyond just being directly involved with the whole stress pathway, also has some inhibiting effects uh, in mitochondrial respiration or energy production along the electron transport chain. So it's basically a stress, like it is part of that stress cascade that induces that backup energy production and basically inhibits the complete oxidation of, of substrate, which is Another way of saying it's making our energy production much less efficient and coming at a huge cost and really not doing much to benefit anybody, even from the uh, like body composition standpoint. So overall, I think doing anything to boost nitric oxide is generally not a, a great idea. A lot of the supplements that are used for this are arginine based or citrulline or like beet or beetroot. Uh, I don't know if I mean, well, there's, beetroot there's a, is directly nitrates. Like right. you're literally right. taking concentrated nitrates. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. And they'll do like juices of those or they'll just include it as an ingredient in supplements. So those are things that are often used and I would say really offer no benefit from even from like the performance standpoint and definitely come at a cost. So not a fan of those. Uh, you had mentioned the pre-workouts as well. And just as a just to start off, and we talked about this last episode, is that is like this idea of whether you should even need a pre-workout to work out. Like, do you, A, are you rested and recovered? B, do you enjoy what you're doing? Or are you just like forcing some sort of exercise because you feel like you have to? And like, could you maybe change things up so that you enjoy it more or, or changing up the type of exercise or, or whatever else there is there? And also, are you getting enough sleep? Like, if all those things are in place, do you really need something to help you get through your workout? I, I think in most cases, the answer would be not a really warm up. You need a warm up. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. A nice warm up would be helpful. Right. But yeah, I mean, if you wanted to do like a little caffeine or taurine and whatever, sure. Right. But even then, like that's that's like that's still besides the point. Right. Like, could, exactly. can those things help? Yes. Those things can specifically help those things or creatine that has been proven to help. Uh-huh. Right. Not necessarily as a pre-workout. Um in, in the sense that it's going to like be a stimulant, but I, ideally like you should be able to go work out without having to take a heavy amount of stimulants. Like if you have, if you need to rely on the stimulant to work out, then the question would be like, 
number one, either your motivation (laughs) or yeah. What's your motivation for working out or number two, like, what are you doing physiologically, right? Like what's going on internally and what are you sacrificing to look a certain way? Exactly. Yeah. And if you're willing to sac- make that sacrifice to look a certain way, and it may not even be necessary, but if you are, you know, then that's, <laughs> that's a different story. Yeah. That's at least recognize that. Yeah. That's not our, that's not what, how we current or we think how we, what we think is the way we would go about it. Right. Yeah. 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 So that, so that's part one is, why do you, why would you even need a pre-workout in the first place? And then, yeah. And so examining that and there's, you know, laid out some possible things there, but then the other part is, yes, there might be certain circumstances where you decide with all that in mind, you think that using something as a quote unquote pre-workout is a good choice. And I don't think that that's never the case. I mean, there's certain contexts where that's fine. Or if you just feel like you work out better with it, or I mean, again, just recognizing why you're using it, what potential drawbacks are all of that. And then, okay, if you do want to use a pre-workout, what might be a good option there? So you mentioned caffeine, which I agree with. So just having a cup of coffee or using caffeine pills, if you wanted to do that, there are a lot of benefits to coffee and caffeine. We've talked about those in a previous episode that I'll link to. So I'd say that would be a good option. Um, with that in mind, Red Bull is actually decent. I mean, the kind of the the one that's with sugar and then... Yeah, not the fake fake sugar one yeah so like i think it's the original i don't know i've never had red bull so uh but i know that in general it's like caffeine taurine there's a couple of things a bunch of yeah. B vitamins yeah yeah and and sugar so is it ideal no like it probably prefer to create something yourself using some of the ingredients but it's fine as far as those sorts of energy drinks or pre-workouts uh i don't i mean that would be kind of the main ones that i would think about as far as like being stimulating and that pre-workout effect Another thing too, just real quick, because this is just so common in the fitness industry is not only using these drinks as pre-workouts, but as energy drinks throughout the day. And again, all the same questions there, like, why do you need that? What's going on in your lifestyle physiologically? Like, I think there are, if you were needing those things to get through the day, that might be something to examine. Yeah. I think there's a different, I, I really think the why, right? If you, why is important. If you need these things to get through the day, then we need to be seeing what's going on. If you are using it to improve your, if you're using caffeine to improve your performance for a workout, makes sense. If you're going to take some, a series of herbs, because you know, you have to sit down and bang out an essay or something like that, what, whatever those herbs or supplements or whatever it is, like, do you, do you need it? No. Would it help out? Like, do you want to optimize from that perspective? Sure. But also it always has to be, what's the risk? What's the reward? What's the, what's the context of taking these things in in Mm -hmm. the overall picture, right? Like using caffeine you're taking it with enough sugar and you have the b vitamins and magnesium and whatever else that you that you need to like process that sugar like it can be a help like it's a little push on the on the gas pedal right if you got to sit down and really do use a lot of mental energy but if you can't get through your day because you don't have the x next cup of coffee then like those are completely different paradigms right there's a difference between optimizing and like like just like not like striving to get through the day, right? You like have to really try versus like you're thriving and now I want to optimize a little bit. Like I want to take X, Y, Z herb or X, Y, Z combination of compounds because I've read the research and it has this X, Y, Z benefit in this larger overall picture. Those Mm -hmm. are two different scenarios. You're using the same substance, but the why and the how is different. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And, And again, being particular about those substances, as you said, making sure that you're aware of their effects and that they are beneficial from this perspective yeah yeah just because joey d at the gym takes it doesn't mean (laughs) that it's ideal right and just because joey d has like an eight pack like we don't know what else joey d's doing on the side and it may not necessarily be i don't know the their their beat elite or whatever it is (laughs) it may be the needle elite (laughs) yeah and and also i i do want to like point this out that there are a lot of people who are you know look great and have an eight pack and don't you know, aren't on anabolic steroids and that's fine too. I mean, there's nothing, but that again, doesn't mean that it's ideal from the health perspective, all all that stuff we talked about before, but yeah, I just think I like to use that because I think it's funny. It's like the traditional, like, I think that's what everybody thinks of, right? Like right off the bat. I think that's like the stereotype. Now, obviously there's, there's exceptions. There's people who are doing stuff the right, there's bodybuilders we know online who are doing stuff the right way. And as far as like, you know, they're not doing drugs and they still look absolutely amazing, whatever, whatever, whatever. Right. So right. It's, it's not that everybody does it. I use it as like a stereotypical joke, right? right. Joey yeah. D at the gym, like 
especially because I'm from New Jersey, right? So that's like, that's, that's like the stereotype where I'm from. It's like this big, this big, like Italian guy, like he's whatever, <laughs> at least in my town where I'm from. <laughs> yeah. 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 Another thing too, that came to mind when it comes to needing a pre-workout or, or something like that is blood sugar. So having carbs or sh- like some form of sugar, uh, in the 30 minutes before workout or hour or before throughout workout. The workout and throughout too. Yeah. yeah. So, yeah. so first like beforehand, before workout is, can be really important, especially if you haven't eaten for a while. I mean, get some food and make sure you're eating throughout the day. If you're having those slumps later in the day, you might not be eating enough. So that's a huge aspect to having enough energy to work out. And so making sure you're having decent blood sugar before you work out and having some carbs is going to be huge there. Uh, that's going to be a huge help from the energy standpoint if that's why your energy is low. And yeah, having some carbs throughout the workout can also help to sustain you. There's some interesting research there where even just having the sweet taste in your mouth is enough to improve like performance and reduce fatigue. But I think raising the blood sugar or actually providing that fuel is going to be much better. Uh, so yeah, having carbs throughout the workout is is a good a good yeah. point as well. Like having not like you know not eating like a potato throughout the right. meal, but yes. like <laughs> you know, and I I think some people use like dextrin or dextrose powder. Some people use like you can use fruit juice. Yeah. Um, our my preference is fruit juice. And then what I would say is prior to the workout, as far as eating goes, like I would stick with something carb based and something lighter. I wouldn't yeah. eat a full meal unless you had like two hours or three hours before you're going to work out because you can re- like you're going to be too full if you take like have a heavy fat meal at least in my experience like you're not gonna you, you might be burping up whatever you ate while you work out because you're basically when you work out when you start using your muscles especially depending on like what you're doing right if you're going to be doing a heavy leg day and you're going to be diverting a lot of blood from your gut to your legs like it does impair digestion that's something that i think is important to keep in mind that when you, your body will preferentially reroute blood supply wherever it needs to go, right? So if you're mm-hmm. going to start using your brain a lot for an essay, you start moving blood more towards the brain. If you're going to start doing a heavy amount of exercise, like the research shows specifically that at different intensities of exercise, blood flow is diverted from the intestine towards the muscles. Right. So you, that's why it's important. And, and that can be an issue with endotoxin as well. And you also see that with, with like marathons and 5Ks and stuff like that. Um, where the blood is actually diverted out of the intestine for such a period of time that you actually can get some intestinal damage. Um, yeah, right. Yeah. So, um, and we're not recommending five Ks here either. It's just that was just to like exemplify the point. Um, but yeah, I would say you want to have like your bigger meal, sort maybe an an hour, two hours before the workout, and then while you're in the workout, you can have some type of intra workout carb especially depending on what you're doing. If you're doing like a long workout, having those carbs can really be helpful. If it's a short workout or whatever, you may not necessarily need. It really depends on what you're doing. But I know at least in my, I was doing a longer bodybuilding workout in the past. Uh, If after I hit like the 45 minute mark, if I didn't have some carbs, I would really start to feel, you know, like I would really start to feel it. If, and then I would try not to go past that time, but this is just, you know, we were just before like the, this ideology developed for my, for us or for me. Yeah. You, you had cut out for a second, but you were saying that in the past, if you were working, you were basically saying that for any workout more than 45 minutes, you wanted to have a carb source during it. Right. That's what you were saying. Yeah. Because I would, I would just feel like I hit the wall. It yeah. would just be like, wow. Like I'm like, I'd be doing good, doing good, doing good. And then all of a sudden I'd start to feel like my adrenaline start to, to pick up. Mm-hmm. And that's where I start to knew that I was, you know, I was pushing it at that point at this point I wasn't necessarily like within the same train of thought. So for me, it was like, I need to complete the workout. And then I started to realize that having juice and some type of carb source, whatever it was, was actually really helpful for making it past that time. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so, so moving on from there, th- those are all really great points. Definitely really important. Uh, th- and another class of, kind of drugs or supplements that are used that I wanted to, that you alluded to earlier is like fat loss drugs and fat loss supplements that drive fat burning and lipolysis. And uh, you mentioned clenbuterol, which is one that's, that's used uh, a pretty strong one. <laughs> and yeah. the, I, I don't want to dwell on this too much. It kind of, it's kind of the same question as the pre-workout is if you're needing to use these for fat loss, then like, why is that? Why is your body not in a place where it can be lean? And is that the best thing for your body at the moment? And how can you get to a place where your body is able to handle that? 
maybe without these things that have a huge cost to them, drive stress, really hammer that adrenaline stress, you know, uh, HPA axis really hard. That's pretty much how all of them work in, in some capacity is that they're driving that stress system in the equivalent of basically starvation or um, like excess stress. And so it's essentially like the worst way to lose weight. Like I would, I mean, it works. It definitely like the, the traditional idea is the ephedrine, caffeine, aspirin stack. Right. Right. And then right. people started realizing that like <laughs> they were getting heart issues with taking too much ephedrine, caffeine and aspirin together. Yeah. But the caffeine and aspirin could be something that's helpful if done appropriately. Right. But the whole point is that it's you're not going to get the increase in lipolysis and stress hormones if you're having carbs with the caffeine, for example. Yeah, that's true. And the doses may be a little higher <laughs> than what we're normally used to. Exactly. Yeah. So trying to lose weight through those means is not a we would say is not a great idea. Definitely not ideal health wise. And it's important to recognize that if you are doing that, you're sacrificing certain aspects of your health. And there are ways to lose fat and be lean without using those things. It just might take a little longer. And so, again, a lot of those things are used for like bodybuilding pre-competition, but they're also just used for people who want to lose some weight and are in, you know, deep in that fitness space. So things to consider. Uh, We've done some episodes specifically talking about weight loss. And, you know, a lot of the things we've talked about the past few episodes have addressed that. So I'll link back to those. And unless there's anything else you want to add there, I wasn't going to, I don't think I have too much else to say about those. No, I just, I just think it's important to point out that, and what our overall picture is with all the, with any type of weight loss or whatever, just briefly, is the idea is to just basically optimize what's going on in cellular function and cellular energy production, right? So getting the electron transport chain and Krebs cycle and cell respiration working. uh, And then basically just uh, from there, that's sort of like the foundational point, the hormonal profile or systems that are sort of overlaying that entire process we want to like move in the right direction so that's 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 the goal is to change the entire environment instead of just try and alter one pathway and force things in one particular direction i think there's a price to pay down the line with doing that that i mean depending on what your context is you have to determine if you're willing to pay that price or not right yeah yeah and that price again is coming even if you're not using these drugs but you're just doing like heavy calorie deficits or Anything that's just based around eating less, cutting carbs, all of those things, or just excessive cardio or fasted cardio, all those things are working in that same system. And yeah, our goal would be to basically improve that conversion from food to energy. So it's not getting stored as fat. There's a lot of different factors there. PUFA is going to block that conversion. Endotoxin will block that conversion. Nutrient deficiencies will block that conversion. Various other aspects, excessive stress will block that conversion. And when you're doing those, when you're relieving those things that block that conversion from food to energy and that system is flowing well, then you don't end up diverting the food towards storage as, as body fat. And hormones are huge regulators there too, but they're, they're kind of circular there where when you're producing more energy, it decreases the stress hormones and increases the hormones that help to convert food to energy. There's like some positive feedback loops basically. Yeah. So the goal is to focus on that energy production and then the rest kind of works itself out in that way. Uh, as opposed to just trying to either force that conversion from food to energy, like override all those blocks by using a ton of ephedrine, for example. <laughs> yep. Yeah, or just like starving yourself so so that you're forced to basically produce energy through those backup pathways. And again, that ends up coming at a cost, a lot of lactate production and a ton of reactive oxygen species and a, a and you'll ton feel of stress. It. Yeah. You will feel it. Uh, to, like when you use these these compounds, like at least for me, like I, I've never used ephedrine, but for me and caffeine, we're not a hundred percent like great friends. If I used high dose caffeine, like I would feel strongly the ramp up in my sympathetic nervous system and mm-hmm. the production of adre- uh, adrenaline and noradrenaline. I, I would not be comfortable. Would I lose weight? Probably. <laughs> and yeah. probably definitely lose weight. But I, I think an important point besides all that, just in the overall picture is that what's going on at the cellular level dictates what happens in the hormonal milieu or environment right the Mm -hmm. hormones are are the messengers or signals of what's happening cellularly and it's sort of like it's a system on top of a system right so it's your your what happens at the cell is being sensed metabolically by the nervous system by the liver by the brain and then there's a coordinated response afterwards where you have basically the adaptive systems or the mobilizing systems need to come into play, 
which are catabolic or you need the anabolic systems to come into play, um, which is like, but then that's the, that's the different shift, right? So it's like if what's happening at the cellular level, there's ample energy, there's ample, whatever, we're going to increase structure, we'll increase um, progesterone, testosterone, thyroid hormone, whatever. And then on the flip side is if there's not enough energy available or there's not enough substrate available for energy or there's something going wrong at the cellular level, then we start activating mobile, mobilizing systems and backup pathways to like, keep the system going, right? It's like putting tape all over the holes and like a million holes in a boat instead of just like when the boat works well, it, when the boat has no holes at all, like it functions very nicely. Yeah. And, and it is just to clarify, at least from my perspective, it is the the energy, the lack of energy rather than lack of substrate. Because so often we see, quote unquote, excess substrate uh, being a f- symptom of yeah. of these conditions that are that really are due to a lack of energy. Diabetes is an example there where you've got more than enough glucose circling around in the blood and in the cells. It's just not being used. That's just a, a quick example. No, I agree. I was yeah. just thinking about it in this perspective because people actually drop their substrate specifically right. here. As, and to get their effect. Yeah, yeah. If there is a lack of substrate, there will be a lack of energy for sure. Uh, so that can be a cause, but it's the lack of energy that's like the determining factor. It's the, factor. the primary, yeah. 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 That's the main thing that we're looking at. Right. Definitely, yeah. I, I think it's helpful to always keep those hormones in context for sure. Especially just thinking about how you know we're centering the series talking about hormones. And yeah. I do have an article uh, talking about hormones as those messengers, as that second level of, of response and signaling. So I'll link to that as well. That kind of digs into some of those things a little in a little more detail. Something I want to bring up here too, just to pose a question is, um, how do I want to pose it? Is if your, horm- if your cellular or your energy state isn't ideal and you're not producing adequate amounts of testosterone or whatever it is right adding exogenous hormone on top of that may pose a problem for the system and i want to just throw that out there because a lot of people are they're moving into like trt is a big thing now and i'm not necessarily against anything like that but i just like guys will hop on trt right away as soon as they get a low lab result instead of Mm -hmm. trying to adjust what's going on at the cellular level what's going on like in their like their body's environment, their body, like the milieu of their body, like changing lifestyle stuff. And then it converts, like then they get this high conversion to estrogen and they get these weird symptoms and issues and then they have to manage it with all these other external drugs. Like the the state of the body, I think is really important to keep in mind there. Um, yeah. And that's as the, first, as the first piece, it's like, why aren't you producing testosterone? What's going on? Instead of just throwing it into the system, right? Because mm-hmm. it's a coordinated, regula- regulated system. And so it's important to recognize that, you know, you can't just throw testosterone on the system and it will, some, for some people it might work, right? For some people it might move the needle for some, for other people, you start converting to a ton of estrogen and it's like, well, why? It's like, well, if you were, had really high cortisol to start bro, because you weren't eating enough, you weren't sleeping enough, you just came out of like this extremely ridiculous cut, whatever it was and your testosterone, whatever it is, you some lifestyle issue where your cortisol is high and your testosterone is low. And then you basically, your cortisol is upregulated, your aromatase throughout the body, throwing testosterone on that symptom system is like a recipe to create uh, estrogen. Mm -hmm. So that you got to address, like, if you want to, if I'm not saying to or not to, I mean, I, I, my personal opinion would be to address what's going on first, like in, in lifestyle, but if you want to throw those hormones into the system, I think it's really important to keep in mind that the system has to be adjusted as well to be able to properly utilize those hormones. And you might find that the system will start producing what it needs to produce once once it's been moved in the right direction. Yeah, exactly. And there can be a place for using those hormones to help move things along in that direction. If you're doing a lot of those right things and you've re- you've removed a lot of those blockages that inhibit yeah. en- you know energy production and all of that using those hormones can help to encourage that positive feedback loop, whether it's thyroid hormones or pregnenolone or anabolic hormones, if used in proper doses in the right context and all of that. But otherwise, they tend to come at a cost. And I've seen that so often where people have really negative effects when using any sort of pro-metabolic hormone, whether it's anabolic or otherwise. And like when they were using it in the context of not eating enough or 
not sleeping enough or nutrient deficiencies and they would have those bad they would have negative side effects if you will even though they're just direct effects and then if, and then using it in another context later on they're they're actually having really good responses so so much of it does depend on that on that context of what's going on underneath and are those underlying issues addressed and really the only situation that i well i wouldn't say only but other than certain particular maybe more rare cases the main place that i see these hormones having benefits or or being ideally used is just as ways to speed up the metabolic adaptation to a better environment so once you're once you are supplying more substrate enough nutrients you've corrected those nutrient deficiencies you've improved gut health you don't have all these circulating endotoxin or other gut toxins you know from other bacteria or other microbes you know fungi uh and you've you know addressed sleep all of those things then i think there can be some benefit to using it using these hormones to help to basically add to the environment like add yeah it's like throwing you a rope if you're in the hole it's but like it's throwing- not, but y- yes it is but the problem with saying in a hole is like a lot of times that means someone hasn't addressed a lot of these things so i think it's more of like you've already made a bunch of steps to get out of the hole and then it's just kind of at the end the rope is helping to like get those last so few steps lift you out yeah right because what what these hormones are as signals is their signals in this case like the pro metabolic hormones are signals of a good environment and so when you have the substrate not just like food substrate but the substrate of a good environment in place whether that's you know getting enough sunlight sleep all of those things and then you want to increase the signals of a good environment it can help to speed that adaptation and speed your own increase in metabolism uh, and that's the case that i see there being some benefit as opposed to using it to correct these issues without actually addressing them you know yeah. to kind of like correct this that's symptoms. kind of like a pharmaceutical approach to things right, right. instead of looking at things systemically it's this reduction reductionistic idea of like i can just change this one pathway mm-hmm. and so the, the thing is is it because I, I think it's hard to parse this out for people right it's like the pharmaceutical approach on one side is reductionism where it's like your testosterone is low so we give you testosterone the other side that that i think we're coming from or we're trying to present or that we are presenting is that we make systemic corrections to the entire bodies, like to your lifestyle and adjust the entire body's internal and external environment. And then we use these compounds that are signals or uh, alter pathways to nudge the system after the context has been changed in a different direction. It's not to, because your testosterone is low, we give you testosterone or you take testosterone or DHEA or whatever. It's you adjust all these things and to move the needle a little bit and to like make those, those, those back end changes after the system has been adjusted as far as lifestyle, micronutrient deficiencies, what macronutrient deficiencies, toxic exposure, gut issues, whatever to nudge it over. That's, that's the point. It's to like move the needle instead of just you low, you need this. So the foundation or the idea behind it is different because a lot of these substances are powerful and a lot of pharmaceutical drugs are pretty powerful. They have a very powerful effect. And with that, they have to be used responsibly. Why is your blood pressure high? Uh, well, you just have a deficiency of, of ACE inhibitors, right? You just need, <laughs> we need to just give you, and that's not actually what anybody says, but it's kind of like the idea. It's like your blood pressure is high. Oh, we just need to, we'll give you this ACE inhibitor and we'll keep lowering your blood pressure. The answer was never, we're going to give you this ACE inhibitor for now to manage what's going on while we fix everything on the back end. Right. right. That, that wasn't a thing that happened there. And then, the, then when, when you see is you just adjust the one piece in the pathway, you start getting all these side effects from the drug. And that's because the drug is just breaking down one pathway, but you still have the pathway still functioning on either side of that block point. So it's important to address, to like downregulate the pathway with the lifestyle and environmental and, and like internal, external environmental changes. And then you can also use these modalities in the meantime, depending on what it is, right? I'm not saying we use ACE inhibitors, right? We're not doctors, but it's just the idea. Well, even if, even if we were, I don't know yeah. that be that we'd be using them. But yes, exactly the well, idea that Ray has talked about losartan, which is an angiotensin receptor blocker, which right. and it can be helpful in in, in the right certain context. context. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. All right, before we wrap up this episode, I did want to make some clarifications as far as the use of exogenous hormones goes. I know that I mentioned that I generally 
tend not to use these things until a lot of the foundational aspects of health are in place. But I do think that there is a use for them in order to get some of those foundational aspects of health in place. So as an example, I know that a lot of people struggle with gut health and using some of the pro-metabolic hormones, whether those are thyroid-based or the sex hormones, uh, using those hormones can help to improve gut health without you know, maybe using any antimicrobials or any other uh, gut-related supplements. So I do think that there's value in using them in that way. I do think they can be a very powerful healing tool in that context, in addition to being used after a lot of those foundational things are in place to kind of further increase metabolism. So I just wanted to make that clarification, and I have definitely seen a lot of benefits in people who are using these hormones in, in these ways or um, in the proper context, again, assuming that there is enough nutrition on board and as as much as can be done has been done from the lifestyle and diet perspective for uh, improving improving various symptoms and, and conditions. So they can help to kind of, again, move through sticking points or to help further increase metabolism. So just wanted to clarify that. In the next and final part of our series on men's hormonal health, we'll be discussing the best supplements to be using to support hormonal health, where today we dissected some of the ones that we might want to be avoiding. If you did enjoy today's episode, please leave a like or comment if you're watching on YouTube or a review or five-star rating if you are listening elsewhere. All of those things really do a lot to help support the podcast and are very much appreciated. And if you are struggling with any of those hormonal symptoms that we discussed today, whether that's trouble putting on muscle or trouble losing body fat or low libido or any other hormonal imbalance type symptoms, and maybe you're not sure where to start after listening through these last few parts of this series or you're unsure where to apply some of this information, or maybe you have been implementing this approach for a little while now, but you're kind of stuck and not sure where to go next, then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash call where you can sign up for a free call with me where I'd be happy to offer you some suggestions as far as uh, what to do next and what might help the most when it comes to rebalancing those hormones. So again, to sign up for that free call, you can head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash call. And again, if you are dealing with any of these hormonal symptoms or any other low energy symptoms, whether that is constant cravings and hunger or fatigue or bloating or uh, digestive inflammation or brain fog or poor sleep or any other low energy symptoms or chronic health conditions, then head over to jfeldmanwellness.com slash energy where you can sign up for a free energy balance mini course where I'll explain how these different symptoms and conditions are really caused by a lack of energy. And I'll also explain the main things that you can do from the diet and lifestyle perspective to maximize your cellular energy and resolve these symptoms and conditions. So to sign up for that free energy balance mini course, head over to jfeldmanwellness.com energy. And with that, I'll see you in the next episode.